Hey guys, and welcome back to Beauty in the Bookcase, where we take a book and we make a look. Today's episode will be tackling the classic novel by Willa Cather, My Antonia. Best known for her stellar depictions of life in the frontier, Willa Cather was actually a graduate of UNO Lincoln in Nebraska, and she actually received the Pulitzer Prize in 1923. To this day, her legacy remains as one of America's greatest female writers, and there is a museum here in Nebraska honoring her. So My Antonia is actually written from the perspective of the character Jim Burden, and it's almost written like a memoir. So we get introduced to the story by an unnamed character who many assume is Cather herself, and she's interested about writing about Antonia's journey, but she didn't feel like she really knew her well enough to do so. So she talks to Jim, and Jim is the one whose perspective we're getting throughout. Antonia and her family came to America as immigrants from Bohemia, which is what we now know as the Czech Republic. And although not all of the family members were as thrilled about, you know, uh, relocating to America, they were hardworking farmers. And so they are now living in rural Nebraska. And they, um, and the way that Jim comes to know of Antonia is because they were actually neighbors. So their families got on pretty well. And as a way to help Antonia sort of adjust to life in America, her father actually speaks to Jim about him um, giving her English lessons. However, the relationship between Antonia, Jim, and really their families doesn't end there. So they actually end up having a really rough winter in which they kind of lose everything. And it's during this time that Jim's family kind of steps up as good neighbors and they kind of just supply Antonia and her family with whatever they need to to make it through. However, unfortunately, their kindness wasn't enough to keep Antonia's father alive. So after his passing, Antonia kind of actually steps up into this parental role, even though her mother is still, still alive. And she takes on a lot of her father's old tasks, essentially becoming the head of the household. Long after this, Antonia actually gets a job as what was then known as a hired girl. Um, and she's working as a cook for a family in, in a larger city. And even though it was frowned upon, Jim continues his relationship with Antonia and other hired girls. Um, in the long run, Antonia and Jim kind of go their own ways through life and they make their own paths but when they finally do reconnect they realize that they've both managed to be able to build a life that's fulfilling in their own ways so it's no surprise that in, back then and still to this day immigrants aren't exactly treated well in america and other countries and that's one of the big topics that this novel kind of tackles and it views it from both a class angle and a race angle. So what this book does is it looks at Antony's life from her perspective as an immigrant who is being very much treated like a second class citizen and as somebody who is white passing but has lived in a lot of very very rural towns. I know that sometimes people have a very hard time coming to terms and treating you as an equal when they see any type of otherness in you. And even though this second this second class citizenship has kind of now been mostly given to immigrants from places like Africa, Southeast Asia, and Latin America, back in the day, Eastern European and like Southern European immigrants were very much looked down upon in and people from places like the Czech Republic, um, Italy, and even Ireland weren't really considered white, or at least the right kind of white. So that's kind of the, the time where we're at in this story. Antonia and her family are 
aside from Jim's family, very much looked down upon by the neighbors. And when I first read this book, I actually read it for a class um, and I, I wrote a paper on it. And as I was doing research and focusing on this whole idea of class and, and otherness, I came across a lot of research regarding, I guess the reasons why these European immigrants were being treated a certain way as opposed to other Euro like European immigrants from other areas. And a lot of it was because they were viewed as morally bankrupt, corrupt, sick, and Americans just believed that they were kind of just going to bring in illness and deviancy and corruption and all these like bad things instead of actually adding to the country. They were very much thought of as uneducated and even diseased. And while Jim and his family are clearly very, very kind, there is a part of me that wonders if perhaps because his last name is Burden, was this Cather's take on Rudyard Kipling's poem, The White Man's Burden, which I could do an entire video about because I hate that poem for many, many reasons. It's very, very um, colonial. So it almost feels like she's trying to make a point by making him, by naming them the burdens, because it's kind of like, well, they were kind to Antonia and her family, but were they doing it for the right reasons or were they doing it because of the white man's burden that they feel that it was their job and their responsibility to help these immigrants transition and sort of civilize and adapt to American culture. Although at the same time, it's not like immigrants like Antonia could just waltz into America, get an education and start a career right off the bat. Antonia, like many other immigrant girls in this book and of this time, then had to settle for jobs as hired girls. Now, hired girls were kind of what we would now call domestic employees. So they did a lot of cooking, cleaning, child care. But you know, these weren't the jobs that you would give to, you know, a, a higher class, white, wealthy girl. These were jobs that were strictly delegated to girls who were coming from different countries from poorer families without much of an educational background. So very much what we now have, even still in, in housekeeping or jobs like fruit pickers and factory workers, where they very much are jobs that are looked down upon. And, you know, as somebody who did work as a cleaner while being an immigrant, it's hard because a lot of people kind of go like, well, yeah, of course you're you're doing it. Um, so yeah, that just kind of really resonated with me. And as I reread this, this story, I kind of felt like I could connect with it a lot more than I originally did. Really at the end of the day, the main reason why these girls were sort of almost expected to be the perfect type to do this type of work was because they were often looked down upon and people expected them to be subservient. Um, and a lot of that came from the fact that they didn't have the opportunity to get an education. So they couldn't really try to get anything else and they just needed to provide for their family. So of course, being hired girls, that brought a lot of judgment from people. And that judgment went as well on to Jim because he hung out with um, Antonia, Lena, and their other friend. I can't remember the other friend's name, but I'm really sorry about that. But, he, you know, he was mixing with these girls and everyone around him, because he was actually going to school where they were working. So, like, in, in the same town. So a lot of the people that knew Jim knew him through school, and they were like, well, why is this, you know, nice white boy hanging out with these hired girls. Like that's weird. Why is he not paying attention to our girls? But it really does make you think because even though Jim never admits feelings for Antonia, he does end up dating Lena for a while, but that doesn't happen until they're both in Massachusetts instead of in this small town in Nebraska, which 
made me wonder that given the stigma, would he even have entered that relationship with Lena in the first place if he was still in Nebraska, if they were both still in Nebraska? Or, you know, would it have mattered? Or was that the reason why he never felt comfortable um, confessing his feelings towards Antonia? Because the only world in which they knew each other was a world in which she was an immigrant and she was a hired girl and she didn't have an education and she came from a, a poor family. So would that kind of really have been the reason that at least subconsciously Jim, even though he was friends with these girls, he still kind of felt a bit of that shame and that judgment of these girls and I aren't really on the same status so like we can be seen together as friends but not as anything more and this of course then brings up another very important point regarding class in this book which is how immigrant girls were very much fetishized in this community a lot of the men viewed them as sexual objects and they they were almost kind of like the practice dummy so that they could get you know, sexual experiences before actually settling down, but they never viewed these girls as marriage material. You know, it was like they would fool around with the immigrant girls, but eventually they would settle down with one of the rich girls, you know, the merchant's daughters who were, again, the right kind of white and the right kind of girls. And quite frankly, I'm sure you're all disgusted by this thought just as I was. But at the end of the day, that's still something that's very much happening with immigrants and with second generations and even just different ethnicities. There are people out there who still fetishize different looks and different ethnicities and races. And, you know, they're after that exoticism. And you see that a lot, especially with men who will go after women of certain races and ethnicities because of stereotypes and because they're looking for women who are subservient and who they can easily manipulate and control and know that it's not gonna cost them in the long run because it's what their culture has taught them to accept. Disgusting, yes. Accurate, unfortunately, also yes. Interestingly enough though, while Antonia and a lot of the other immigrant girls were very much so viewed as inferior and even, you know, just immigrants in general, Cather had actually a really different opinion than what was considered the norm at the time. She actually made sure that all of the girls in her story were actually really strong and driven and focused and it was incredible just to, to see how they took the lead in a story um, that took place in, in a time and a place where, you know, women were still supposed to be inferior. Now, as I mentioned earlier, after her father's death, Antonia does very much become almost the patriarch of the family, the, the head of the household very much so. And after she takes on all these duties um, with the farming, she goes on then into being a hired girl, not really so much for herself or in looking for any freedom from her life on the farm, but because her family needed her and she needed to, to be able to support them. And what's so interesting about this though is that while nowadays it's much more common to see stay-at-home dads or you know, women who are the main breadwinners for a family, whether, you know, they do have a, a partner who stays at home or they just earn more or they're a single mother. Back in the day, that wasn't the case. It was, you know, very much so a more traditional lifestyle in which the woman, the women stayed home or if they did work, they worked in like the family farm or somewhere nearby, you know, they weren't really independent and they very much were not the family's main source of income. Still, Cather decided to make quite the feminist statement in this book. 
While at the end of the day, Antonia did decide to become a mother, some of the other girls ended up going into business. The bottom line is every single woman in this story decided her own path. She didn't rely on anybody else, nor did she let somebody else pick for her. Antonia herself, she gets abandoned by her first partner after they have a child together. And even then, her spirit very much remains unbroken. She stays focused, she continues providing for her family, and eventually she does marry another man and they do have a big, wonderful family. But that was her choice. She wasn't made to get married. She decided to get married. She decided to be a mother. So whether choosing the very challenging path of motherhood and homemaking or going into the stressful world of business, Cather wanted to tell women that they could choose, that they could be the leaders of their own lives. These were strong-willed women that Cather created to inspire generations to come. And speaking of inspiring generations to come, Cather seems actually quite inspired by immigrants and their stories. She very much sees them as strong and exemplary and hardworking. And even though the world she depicts often very much shuns this otherness, her book is kind of like an ode to immigrants. Like many immigrants today, the ones in this story were also coming to America, either escaping some type of horror back home or just wanting to make a better life for their families. And while they were grateful for the opportunity, we do still see that nostalgia, that longing for home and for traditions. But it's this longing that actually ends up causing a problem for some Americans. And again, once I reread this, I could see it in my own experience. You know, when I was in, in under, my undergrad, I did have a professor who very much did not like Puerto Ricans. And, you know, one of the reasons why he was so aggressive towards my people, so to speak, was because he saw it, he saw our love and our pride in our culture as us not wanting to adapt, not wanting to be fully American. Yeah, I mean, it's usually quite easy to tell a Puerto Rican, especially abroad, because we'll have the flag on us in some way, shape, or form, and, you know, we still eat our food and we talk, you know, we speak our language, but I, I, I just, I have a hard time kind of processing this issue with with otherness, which we see in this book as well, is, is people having a big issue with these immigrants coming and still sticking to their rituals and their culture and their language and their religions and everything. It's just, I guess, what I'm trying to say is that I find it very interesting that a country so often referred to as a melting pot doesn't really want to, I guess, recognize the contributions that immigrants have given to America and how much of what is now American culture has come from somebody else's culture. I don't really want immigrants to come and melt into the American culture by mixing their own culture into it and interpreting their own version of what it's like to be an American. Instead, they kind of want to melt away their otherness and just have them adapt and act like Americans and speak American. I know it's English, but you know, you've seen the videos of people being like, this is America, speak American. And that's very much something that was very prevalent back then and still prevalent now. And that was something that really impacted me when when I was doing my research back, back in college. As I read through a lot of these articles that were from like the 1900s, a lot of the speech and a lot of the ideas that I was seeing were very much ideas that, you know, racists still hold today. It was very much this idea of 
you know, if you come to my country, you have to speak my language and you have to adapt and you can't have any type of attachment to where you came from. But also you and I are not the same because I was a settler and you're an immigrant. And for some weird reason, that's not the same thing, even though they just call it different names to make it sound better. I actually read an argument and it made me so mad. And it has stayed with me for all of these years because it made me so mad in which um, somebody claimed that the reason why Americans, well, the first settlers were apparently not to be considered immigrants was because America wasn't known as America until they came here. So basically what they said was, well, the Native Americans, they're native to a country that no longer is this place. You know, like they weren't Native Americans until America was named America, Amer until America was named America. So they very much gave themselves privilege to be like, well, Native Americans aren't actually the first Americans because without us, the settlers, America wouldn't be America. So technically, we are the first people of the United States of America. And they were, they just so happened to be here. I don't, he never really explained then in what position that put Native Americans. They just kind of went like, well, we the settlers are the real Americans and anyone else who comes in is an immigrant. But yeah, nothing on like what Native Americans were in that weird world vision. <laughs> so what's it all about? At its core, My Antonia is Willa Cather's ode to women and immigrants. She highlights their hardships, their successes, and their willpower, which helps them to rise above and make a brand new life in America. She forces America to actually look at immigrants and their otherness in a brand new light by taking away the demonization that ran and still runs in very much anti-immigrant and racist sentiments. Cather actually showed the beauty that immigrants add to America. Moreover, she also penned a love letter to women and feminism. Letting women know that they could forge the path that they chose was right for them, that they could be the leaders of their own lives. As I said, I first read this book in my second year of college. And back then, even though I remember enjoying it and being fascinated by the idea of otherness in it, I don't think I realized how much I connected with Antonia's story as I do now. And maybe that's because really in my second year, I had only been living in America for two years. And I hadn't had the plethora of experiences that I have had now having lived here for I think about seven or eight years. So with all that said, I definitely think that once, you know, I've reread it and reanalyzed it, this is, book is definitely a must read for me. It's about a 4.5. I think it's so brilliant and so ahead of its time about what America should be. And it's a good reminder of how little our behaviors towards immigrants have changed. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you liked it, make sure to leave a like and let me know in the comments what your thoughts are on my analysis of this book or what your own thoughts are regarding this book. Be sure to subscribe for more videos like this and definitely hit that notification bell so you know every time I upload on Wednesdays and Sundays and I'll see you guys next time. Mm -hmm.